Well, good morning. Good morning. Ah, it's good to see everybody here this morning. I feel like for both Mike and I, the newness of what we have going on here has not faded, and that's a good thing. After 2020, it's so good to be able to just see everybody's faces and worship together. Um, let's go ahead, and uh, I'd like to invite you to bow your heads with me as we go to God in prayer. Let's pray together. Our Holy Father in heaven, we are gathered here today in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, Father, standing in confidence, standing in love, standing in humility, Father, thankful that you have redeemed us by a most perfect blessing, giving the life of your Son. Father, renew our spirits now as we seek you through the holy word of God. Give us ears to hear, Father, what you have to say in your word. And give us that spiritual energy to walk after the manner of Jesus Christ. And Father, we ask for forgiveness for the ways in which we have not exercised wisdom in the best way or have failed you in some way, Father, but we're thankful for the abundance of forgiveness by the blood of Christ. Renew our spirits, give us encouragement. I don't know what anyone's going through this morning, today, in this group, but I pray that you give us peace, a peace that surpasses understanding. And thank you for bringing Mike and I and this entire church through this series. Help us to walk after the way of justice, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with you. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ, and amen. Woo, okay, so this is the last one, you guys. This is the last one of the series. You made it. I made it. Congratulations to us, right? We got to the last message of a 14-part series, seven parts for Mike, seven parts for me, where Mike has given us the theology of justice, and I've tried my best to try to figure out how we can see where the rubber meets the road, how we can apply this today. And I just want us to take a moment to really just breathe in what we've discussed. At this point, we should feel like we have been thoroughly equipped to do justice, as Micah says, uh, in this world, as people who follow Jesus Christ. We have talked about the fatherless and widows in the last message that uh, I addressed and how this is really a couplet. And we've talked about all of the quartet of the vulnerable, the individuals that God cares for that's mentioned over and over again in the Law and Prophets, right? Where we have the poor, the sojourner, the widow, the orphan, the poor, the sojourner, the widow, the orphan. We talked about the poor and how we might do justice in that sense. We talked about the immigrant and refugees and, and so on. We talked about lamenting and what it meant to actually be a practitioner of active listening, hearing the complaints and, and the cries of a group that feels like they are disenfranchised and joining in in that lament. And we talked about really where justice begins. And where does it begin? It begins in your home. It begins with you. It means setting your own house in order first, doesn't it? And so that's what we have been talking about. And I just have one more tool that I want to add to your toolbox today. Um, now, here's what I want to do. Now, these aren't the points of the sermon, but what I want to accomplish today is, number one, I want to engage with the topic of racism. And then I want to engage with some of the thoughts that Mike presented to us last Sunday, okay? And, and what I mean by that is I want to talk about this topic, which really can be added to the quartet of the vulnerable. When we think about modern issues today, what people are thinking about when they use that big word justice, they think about racism. So let's talk about it. And then I want to talk about specifically how Mike has shown us how we begin to address that uh, today, all right? So it's going to be a lesson that I call the third way and um, that's what we're going to be uh, addressing. Now, right off the bat, hopefully Mike and I have done a good job of conveying how the subject of biblical justice goes beyond just the topic of racism, that it transcends just racism. If, if you guys didn't get that point, I regret to inform you, Mike and I are going to have to re-preach this entire series from the beginning. <laughs> I'm kidding, I'm kidding, right? I'm not going to do that to you, but but whenever we think about this, that's really the point, that biblical justice is something that, that spans a multitude of, of issues and varying uh, problems that we have going on, right? Now, uh, we still have to address racism, though. 
because that is what the world thinks of when they use this word justice. That's what they equate it with. That's all we think about, almost exclusively, when we use the word justice. So let's talk about it. Now, here's what doesn't matter. I recognize, through all of the great correspondence that we've had throughout the series, and a lot of people have provoked to a lot of thought and conversation and messaging and email, and we've been talking about these things, and that's good. We think that's a win if we're talking and engaging with these ideas. And I realize that, you know, trying to avoid overgeneralization, um, there are varying gradations of belief on this, right? There are different positions that we take and different things that we believe about this, and that's okay. You know, some of us, we, we, we tend to think, um, especially in a time when everything, almost everything is being labeled as racist, we recognize really racism is just an evil that is perpetuated on a certain ethnic culture. Or, you know, we think about racism in an individualistic sense, that it's something that just happens on an individual basis. Or some of us think that it's a systemic issue, or some of us see that it's both. Uh, some of us, you know, maybe we're sort of opposed to the group identity, group politics, group mindset, because lo and behold, they're wrapping themselves around an idolatry maybe we don't agree with, and goodness gracious, they got t-shirts and ball caps now, right? And so we want to lean more towards an individual sense of understanding uh, this topic. And of course, I sympathize with that. Uh, I think about that really famous quote from Alexander Solzhenitsyn who penned the Gulag Archipelago when he said that the line separating good and evil passes not between states, passes not between even political parties, passes not between classes, but through the human heart and through every human heart. We sympathize with that. So, so none of that matters. That's not what I want to talk about. Here's what matters. We are all gathered here today in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. We are the people of God. And we recognize what it means to be the church, to be called out of every tribe, tongue, people, and nation, and dedicated to a gospel of a Lord God who has eradicated every barrier that mankind sets up against each other. And so, yes, we stand against racism. Nobody's a racist here. We want to promote what is good and do the next right thing. So let's talk about it, all right? And the question that we want to discover today is, uh, how do we do justice with regards to racism? How do we begin to work for justice against racism today? And for that, I want to introduce you to a little friend of mine. His name is Subversion, okay? This is the first thing I want us to talk about. Now, this is a word uh, that means the undermining of the power and authority of an established system or institution. And at first, that might seem a little problematic, except for the fact that it is mentioned everywhere in your Bibles, okay? Now, not literally, but the concept of subversion is there in the beginning. The prophets subverted. God himself subverts some of the things that we see in the Bible. And it comes from a Latin word that just means to turn upside down, just like that church you read about in Acts chapter 17, who went about causing the world to turn upside down, right? Subversion is the way that we are going to begin to address some of these issues that we see, particularly with racism or really any justice issue at all. Now, I don't want to be cliche, but I want to give you an example of how this works out in our lives, and then we'll get into how the Bible talks about this. But first of all, a quick example of how the rubber meets the road. Now, I don't want to be cliche, but let's talk about uh, the best example for this, which is the civil rights movement. And the reason why we're talking about this is because not only does it address directly the issue of racism, but it also talks about what I mean precisely whenever I say the word subversion, all right? Now, whenever you look at the civil rights movement in our recent history, and you think about some of the difficulties that were being experienced by African Americans, how they address that, this is gonna be generalizing a little bit, but it seems like there were mainly two ways that they could approach that, all right? Now, there were some African Americans who dealing with those difficulties, those racisms, and what they would do is they would try to keep their heads down, right? They didn't want to draw attention. They don't want to focus on that. They want to avoid it as much as possible. Keep your head down, protect yourself, just live my life and get on with it. And that led to a newer generation who didn't want to deal with things in that way, a vocal generation, a resistant generation, a generation that advocated violence. And so we have voices like, just for example, a voice of Malcolm X, X, crossing out his slave name as he referred to it, uh, Malcolm Little, right, uh, joining the Nation of Islam and beginning to preach after seven years of incarceration 
saying things like, brother, if a white man lays his hand on you, you make sure he can't ever do that again. And we have a resistant crowd. Now, capitulation and not wanting to do anything and avoid it at all possible, new generation advocating resistance and violence. And out of this comes a third way, a different way, because, of course, Malcolm X predates Martin Luther King Jr. by a few years. And he comes into it, and he advocates an entirely different way, not capitulating, trying to ca cause individuals to recognize his own personal humanity and the humanity of his people and the human dignity that they had, but at the same time not advocating resistance of a violent sort, a third way, a subversive way. And I recognize that today there's a school of thought that doesn't want to pit Malcolm X and Martin Luther King Jr. as so separate. And of course, they were aimed at the same goal. But you cannot deny historically that they took two different paths to get there. Now, if you want uh, to remember a lesson I preached previously, whenever we talked about Jesus and the bruised reed that he would not break and the smoldering wick he would not put out, the point we made in that sermon, do you remember? Was that it's not just important that we do justice, but how we do justice. And so, what does Martin Luther King Jr. do? What he does is subvert. This was a third path, unlike the other two. He told his followers, quote, the racist enemies who are persecuting you are damaged souls, and you have the power to deliver them from their own damaged souls. That by following the path of love, you're giving them the opportunity to become fully human. Now, do you notice what he did? He flips the script. He subverts. He turns it upside down. No longer are these empowered racist oppressors, but now they're human beings as well. Our enemies are human beings, and you need to give them an opportunity for human potential to change, to be something better than what they are. He flips the script. He subverts. He pursues the third way. Right. Now, I want to talk about how this is mentioned in your Bible by, by bringing back up a passage that Mike talked about last week. Turn your Bibles, if you would, if you want to get a uh, bigger context to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5, and uh, we're going to read this section in the Sermon on the Mount, and just look at it, analyze it a little bit uh, closer, uh, beginning of verse 38, all right? So Matthew chapter 5, beginning of verse 38. We're going to see what this third way looks like. And here's what it's written. You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist the one who is evil. But if one slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. And if anyone would sue you and take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. And if anyone forces you to go one mile, go with him two miles. And we're stopping at those three because of uh, the implication to Roman society in which the Jews lived at that time. Now, something interesting about Jesus. I don't know about you, but my temptation whenever I look at the Lord or at least whenever I assume I know the Lord based on my, you know, cultural Christian identity, is I like to think of Jesus as this sort of docile, timid creature, right? You know, gentle Jesus, meek and mild, and he's just going around telling everybody to be really, 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 really nice, right? And that's, that's kind of my temptation of you, Jesus, this way. Except when you think that the biblical Jesus is not really like that. It's not just about being nice for Jesus. That there's actually this passage, and I've thought about this a lot this past week, where in one of the main speeches in the book of Matthew, Jesus actually teaches his disciples to go out and to evangelize in Matthew chapter 10. And he says something really strange at the very beginning of his uh, advice to them. Here's what he says. He says, Behold, I send you as sheep in the midst of wolves. And he says, Therefore, be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. And I think about that, and you know what I do? I just read harmless as doves. All right, Jesus, we're going to be sheep in the midst of wolves. We're going to be harmless. We're going to be innocent. We're going to be nice. But what does he say? Be wise as serpents, harmless as doves. It's not either or. It's both and. And that wise as serpents is, is really just evoking not only Hebrew imagery, but we get the same imagery today. What is a serpent? A serpent is cunning. A serpent is crafty. A serpent is tricky, like we read in many stories in the Hebrew Bible. A serpent is clever. Be clever. Be wise in your dealings with the world. And so we take that same spirit and see that here in this text. Now, this text, what does it mean? This could mean generally just go above and beyond and break your back being as nice as possible to anyone. It could mean that. Or there's slight hints that maybe Jesus is pushing a little bit further here, that there's some of that cleverness in what he's advocating. 
The first thing he says there is he quotes this passage from Exodus, a lex talionis law, which is just a law about retaliation, where he says, you have heard it said in the law, an eye for an eye and a tooth for tooth. Now, why does God institute this law? The reason why God says this is actually because he's trying to put a cap on retribution. He's trying to put a cap on justice, so to speak. He's trying to actually make it more just. He's trying to say, you know what? If somebody takes out your eye, all you can require of them is an eyeball. We're trying to uh, prevent a sort of Hatfields and McCoy situation, which is just retaliation back and forth in the other. That's what's happening here. And Jesus says, I want to prevent you from doing that on a personal basis. We're not talking about government. We're not talking about law and Romans 13. We're talking about on a personal basis. And he says, I don't want you to join a resistance movement, but here's what I want you to do. In verse 39, he says, uh, if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. Now, this is interesting. What does that mean? Is he just being hyperbolic? Well, point to your right cheek, okay? For someone to slap you on your right cheek, that means they would have had to backhand you. Why? Because they're slapping you with their right hand. Why? Well, the left hand, let's just say, they don't use that for slapping, okay? They, they use the right hand for slapping. And so for somebody to slap you, they'd have to backhand you. Now, this was something concerning more than just injury. This was adding insult to injury. This was a dehumanizing act for someone to backhand you. It was something in their patriarchal age reserved for children, for slaves, for women, okay, sadly. And it was a way of saying, you're below me. When someone backhands you, you're below me. So what does Jesus tell them to do? He says, turn the other cheek. So now they have to do this. And essentially what that's saying is, look, I'm not telling you to fight back, but whenever you tell them to slap you on the other side, that's saying, you can slap me, but now no longer as an inferior, but as an equal. That is subversion. That is the third way. Now the next example he gives there is in verse 40. He says, now if anyone would sue you and take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. Now the picture he's developing here is that there's an outer coat and an inner coat, and this is generalizing somewhat, but there's an outer coat and inner coat. If someone's going to take your inner coat, give them your outer coat, your blanket, your, your, your lifeline as well. Now, what would happen in this situation? If someone is being judiciously unjust, being, uh, abusing the court system, he says, you know what, just give it all to them. And you would be left naked, basically only with a loincloth. And you know what you're essentially saying to the oppressor in that moment? You're saying, you know what, this is really the truth of what you're doing to me, and you shame them by your nakedness. That you want to to be unjust? This is exactly what you're doing to me. And so by your generosity, you're provoking repentance. You're provoking shame. The last example he gives there. Verse 41, and if anyone forces you to go one mile, go with him two miles. I mean, you guys are Bible students. We've talked about this before. This had to do with the Roman practice where basically a soldier or a military official could conscript a Jew, a random native of the land, to basically serve as a porter, to carry his, to be a caddy, to carry his stuff a long way, or even to engage in building activities. We see the same word being used about Simon of Cyrene, who helps Jesus carry his cross to Golgotha. And what's interesting, and I didn't know this, but what's interesting is that the laws were actually very strict at this point. The law said you could cause them to carry it for a mile, which was a Latin or a Roman measurement, not a Jewish one. You could cause them to carry it for a mile, but no further, no more than that. So what happens whenever you go the second mile? All right, buddy, keep going. We're almost at the mile mark. All right, you can stop there. No, stop. No, 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 no. Don't keep going. You begin to alarm this individual by your love, by your generosity, by going above and beyond to the injustice of the system. It was a third way yet again. It was subversion to the point. Here's the amazing thing. When you look at Jesus, even at the point when he unjustly is going to be tried and crucified, he isn't weak and docile at all. When standing before Pontius Pilate in John chapter 18, you know, I'm think, I think about Jesus and the testimony he gave, not only before the Sanhedrin, but before Pilate. You have no power in me at all unless it was given to you from my father above. It's, it reminds me of that part in C.S. Lewis when he's talking about um, Aslan, who was a Christ figure in the books. And an individual asks him, he says, well, is Aslan, this lion, safe? And he says, uh, of course he's not safe, but he's good. He's the king, I tell you. 
We want Jesus to be the sort of safe figure, and that's not exactly what we see. We see the apostles, for example. Are they safe in Acts chapter 4 when they're standing before the Sanhedrin? They say, hey, we're telling you, stop preaching the resurrection, going about turning the world upside down. Stop doing that. And they say, we cannot but speak and preach what we have seen and heard. We have to obey God rather than men. And you know what it says there? In Acts chapter 4, it says, these officials perceived that Peter and John had been with Jesus because of the way they were talking. These guys must have been influenced by that Jesus fella. Was Paul that way when he's before the tribunal in Acts chapter 22 and 23, when he's about to be beaten and waste to the last possible second and say, hey, guess what? I got Roman citizenship too. Well, I purchased mine for some money. He says, yeah, but I was born a Roman citizen. Do we see that safety there? And of course, this accords with another passage. Turn with me to Romans chapter 12. I want you guys to see this with your own eyes. Romans chapter 12, and this is a great parallel, maybe even to write in your Bibles at Matthew 5 when Jesus teaches to love our enemy. Because in this passage, Paul's basically just explaining what it means to overcome evil with good, to love your enemy. And notice specifically what Paul says. Romans 12, I'm going to start reading in verse 18. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God, for it is written, vengeance is mine. I, the Lord, will repay, says the Lord. Uh, to the contrary, instead, verse 20, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. For by so doing, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. What are we talking about whenever we're talking about overcoming evil with good? He says, do this act of love and generosity and kindness in such a way that you heap coals of fire on their head. And this was a Hebrew image of causing compunction, causing guilt, causing repentance, stirring up in their mind a conscience that I'm doing wrong because of the goodness that you are showing me. That is subversion. That's the third way that we're talking about. Last example is from the book of Philemon. Go ahead and turn your Bibles there. I want you guys to see this as well. Now, uh, I had Logan read for us the entire book because, as he said, uh, it's, it's a really short book. And I love Philemon. I love Philemon. But uh, can I just confess to you, preacher confession, I have not always loved Philemon. As a matter of fact, um, I remember, because I'm kind of a pragmatist at heart, I think everything should have a practical utility uh, in my life. Uh, I remember reading the Bible and understanding inspiration and seeing there are 27 books in the New Testament and thinking, man, you got 27 books to choose from and you chose Philemon? Why did that make the cut, right? But you look at Philemon and the assumption is, is that Paul has 13 letters that he's written and, uh, you know, you begin, uh, obviously, with uh, uh, 1 Corinthians there, um, or excuse me, Romans, all the way to 1 Corinthians, and you end with his last letter, the shortest one, Philemon. And Philemon is an interesting story. It's basically a short letter written to this Christian Philemon about his bondservant or his slave named Onesimus. Now, I'm careful about using slave because there isn't exactly a parallel with uh, the chattel slavery that happened in this country two or three hundred years ago, Right? This is not exactly the same thing. It's indentured servanthood. It wasn't based on race. It was sometimes like debtor's prison in a way. So anyway, he's writing to this, to the slave owner. And he says, listen, Onesimus came to me running away from you. And he converted while he was with me. And I'm sending him back to you to receive him as more than a slave, but as a brother. And here's what he says. Verses 15 and 16. For this is perhaps why he was parted from you for a while that you might have him back forever, no longer as a bondservant, but more than a bondservant, as a beloved brother in Christ, especially to me, but how much more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord. This book contains an extraordinary idea, absolutely unbelievable when you contextualize it, the time in which Paul is writing. Bond service, slavery in the Roman and Greek, Greco-Roman world was such a fixture. It'd be like if you eliminated credit today. All right, credit's wrong according to God. Everyone's, like everything would stop, right? That's how important it was to their economy at the time. And what he does here is so amazing. He, basically, he, he requests three things. First of all, he says, number one, I want you to accept Onesimus, who's run away from you and is converted, I want you to accept Onesimus back as a brother in Christ and don't punish him. 
The second thing he says is, please send him back to me as an assistant. Send him back to me so he can help me out. And number three, and this is where it gets tricky, perhaps in so doing, you'll even give him his freedom. Now, some have critiqued the New Testament for not teaching blatantly against slavery, but what Paul does is even greater. He has the audacity to think about the implications of the gospel and to place a rapidly ticking time bomb to the institution of bond service in the Roman world with this idea, with this single letter alone about Philemon, a ticking time bomb that eventually would go off and eradicate it. Paul models Christ himself by identifying both with the offender, Onesimus, and Philemon, and reconciling the two who have been offended. For Onesimus' sake, God has made Paul a debtor. That's the gospel. That is subversion. That's what Paul does. He doesn't go on the nose. He takes an alternate route. To think creatively about how to promote justice by third way thinking, that's what God is calling us to. He's calling us to a gospel of subversion where we are free to think creatively about third way thinking, to subvert unjust ideas and actions. And I'm saying, what does that mean then for you? What are those possible solutions? Now, I can't stand up in here and take up all your time by listing all of the ways that might work out today. But I am saying you can. At the same spirit that's in Paul and me and you is in you. And so we can figure these things out with our creativity. Now, what I want to do here is engaging that idea. Secondly, I just want to talk about the gospel of subversion. You know, we've talked about justice for now 14 lessons. And it's been a conviction of of mine and Mike's that we have everything we need in the gospel. That is utterly inexhaustible. It's exhausting on everything. And if you go back to the gospel, there are the keys for us in dealing with this. The first thing I want to draw our attention to is forgiveness in the gospel. Something strange is going on today, especially whenever you compare the way the subject of race is being dealt with today with the way it was in, during the civil rights movement. And a lot of people have said it's like comparing apples to oranges. There's even individuals quoting saying, this was not your grandfather's civil rights movement, okay? And there's this call today um, overwhelming us everywhere to be harsher. And it doesn't really matter on what side you're on, okay? Any side, any hypothetical side, the call is to be harsher, more militant, more angry, more violent. Um, I don't often do this, but I would actually encourage everyone in this room, you would be much better for reading an article by Tim Keller called The Fading of Forgiveness. And it's his thoughts on what exactly is going on right now. And it's about this thrust where forgiveness is being undermined today. The importance of forgiveness and reconciliation, which are absolute hallmarks of Christianity and of the church, are being undermined and pushed out through the door. Forgiveness seems problematic. Forgiveness, he says, quote, is seen now as radically unjust and impractical, as short-circuiting the ability of victims to gain honor and virtue as others rise to defend them. What I see going on now is people are forgetting the third way of creativity, of thinking, of a subversion. They're only opting for more violence and more anger. Maybe during a time when all the media wants to show you is how angry we are and how we dehumanize each other all the time and The greatest subversion in that moment is to humanize someone by forgiving and by allowing them the potential to change. I think we need to restore the church to being a well-known community of forgiveness and reconciliation. Now, maybe in this context, in this world, you know what the most subversive, uh, the most countercultural thing would be? Is to still believe in forgiveness and reconciliation. Maybe that's what we need to do. But let's go a little bit further. As we talk about the gospel of subversion, let's go to the communion table. And Mike talked a lot about this, but I just want to highlight something as well. Being together and observing the Lord in this Lord's Supper is what it's about. And I read a story about how it wasn't always that way. Now, this takes place during that period of chattel slavery. 
But uh, Phil Riken writes about this. I'm going to tell you the story. So a tragic example about how the Lord's Supper is actually abused, how the very subversion in the communion table is actually undermined and subverted, is this. He says a tragic example comes from the history of the Southern Presbyterian Church prior to the Civil War. In those days, he says, it was customary for Presbyterian elders to give their parishioners tokens signifying they were eligible to participate in the Lord's Supper. All right? So in that day, if you were eligible, if you were a baptized Christian, you were given a token. And sadly, in some churches, African slaves were not given the customary silver coin, but one made of base metal, a lesser metal. Nor were they allowed to receive the communion until all the white church members had been saved, served. This was a divisive and a prejudicial way of handling the communion that God enters to signify our union together in Christ. Whether we believe the gospel or not, their actions clearly denied it. What do our actions say? When I read that, I was heartbroken because it's like, you know what this message, you know what this meal means? Of course we recognize the cross. Of course we recognize forgiveness and salvation that we have in him and the price that was paid. But it's also an emblem of us coming together of all of those grains of wheat being ground in so that it can be one bread, one body, of all those grapes being squeezed out and trampled underneath the foot so it could be one cup, us unified, from every tribe, tongue, people, and nation. I got to thinking about this. (laughs) The communion table, Mary Douglas is a cultural anthropologist, and she talks about table fellowship in an essay called Deciphering a Meal. And she talks about how, especially in the New Testament days, basically who you shared a table with, who you ate a meal with, was a way of upholding boundaries. And you see this picture in Galatians chapter 2, where any time the Jews would come up from Jerusalem, Peter would go and eat with the Jews only. It was a way of eradicating boundaries. And the amazing thing about Christianity was that it was subversive to that, that we see Jesus go out and he's sharing a table with tax collectors and sinners, that at one table were gathered all these lame, crippled, blind Uh, Gentile, all these individuals who, beyond the pale, you just wouldn't eat with them. This table is meant to signify that. It's subversive. It's a way of telling, no matter what kind of boundaries are out there in the world, when we come together as a church, we're one. We believe in the unity of all human beings. And then, of course, the cross and resurrection itself. This is the beating heart. At the most basic level, let me ask you the question, what does the cross convey? Now, of course, we spent a lot of time talking about this, and Mike has talked about it a lot, but I mean, even at the, not theology, not biblical, just at the most basic level, what does the cross mean? One of the things it means is that in the face of great evil, what is it going to take to end that evil? Well, it's going to take sacrifice. You know that. We see that in stories all the time. To eliminate turmoil, tragedy, or evil, it's going to take sacrifice. And the picture of the cross is that, you know what, in the face of the greatest evil, might take the uttermost sacrifice you could ever imagine. And it was the extinguishing of the Son of God himself. It was self-sacrifice to end that. But then on the third day, the ultimate subversion. On the third day, what happened? the ultimate rectifying of wrongs. On the third day, what occurred? The ultimate injustice and promise that one day all wrongs would be made right in Christ. And so Peter stands up, and what does he say? He says, this Jesus whom you crucified and you killed and you took by the hands of lawless men, God raised him up. And of that, we are all witnesses. Jesus says in the resurrection, I took your sin and gave you forgiveness. I took your death and turned it into life. I took your story of tyranny and turned it into my victory. That's a version, and that's the gospel, and that's the only thing that we ever come back to in the end. Let's go to God in prayer. A Father in heaven, we love your way, O Lord. 
And we give you the praise and the honor and the glory due your holy name. For in Jesus Christ, you have turned our death upside down. Help us to go back to this story, to dig into its well, to never, Father, see it as exhaustible, to have the power to go out and to pursue the third way, to subvert, to do what is right, to undermine what is evil and unjust in this world. Father, give us the strength and the mind. Bless us, O God, to do that in our world. For we pray as our Lord has taught us that your name would be hallowed, that your will would be done, that your kingdom would come even on earth as it is in heaven, Father. We ask this for your glory. Praise be your holy name. Amen.